Dr. Umar Johnson. Yes, sir. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Um, you're here on a UK tour. Yes. Um, which saw you in Birmingham last month. Yes. Um, but before we, we go into all things masters um, of empowerment, I want to I want to know how you were received in Birmingham. There's a lot of love up there in the Midlands. Uh, yes, a, a lot of love in Birmingham. I've actually been to Birmingham about three times prior. Um, always well attended. A lot of support. Um, it was the same way last Saturday. Uh, just a week ago, uh, not last month, but last week, and it was very well received. Yeah. How did um? How you know what would kind of feed? What's the kind of feedback you got from? Uh, well, my phone hasn't stopped in terms of email messages, <laughs> right. questions, mm. follow ups. When are you coming back? So I always get a lot of support when I come to the UK. Uh, my first visit to the UK was in the fall of 2011. Right. The PowerSys organization brought me over in conjunction with the Black Cinema Club to do a showing of a documentary I was in. And then I started coming back largely through the Power Sis movement about twice a year um, since then. This is probably my seventh or eighth visit since 2011, once almost twice a year on average. You might, you like it here, don't you? I like it here. Yeah, it's a good look. It's a good I look. call it the 51st state <laughs> because when I study the political and the economic and the social and the psychological predicament of Africans here in Europe and particularly in the UK, your reality isn't much different than the African-American reality, which is interesting mm. because as I travel the world and I go all over, people always ask me, how different is it in other places? And it's not. Right. It's amazing how much we exaggerate the differences in our predicament. It's not. I go to Toronto. They'll think their problems are more unique than in the UK. The UK may think their problems are more unique than the States. The States may think their problems are more unique than say Jamaica or Bermuda or the Bahamas. And then even on the continent, mm -hmm. they would also argue that their reality is uh, extremely unique. But what I say to that is there's four constants. Wherever I go in the African world, I've spoken on every continent except Australia. Four constants, mass incarceration of black males, a crisis of single parented black boys, White Jesus is everywhere in the African world. You're not going to go anywhere without white Jesus. And the fourth constant, someone who does not look like us controls the economy everywhere we live on earth. There's not a country or community you can go to where black people run their own economy. I guess this lends itself to the, to the next question. Um, Masters of Empowerment, talk about what attendees can expect. Yes. Um, from, you know, when you take the stage tomorrow. Yes, indeed. Tomorrow night, Saturday, November the 3rd, uh, the master teacher, Elder uh, Baba Muta Baruka, the stepping razor himself, and Dr. Umar Johnson link it up as two Pan-Africanists and Garveyites. Once again, 6 o'clock, the doors open at the lighthouse, and brothers and sisters can expect a powerful message. Whenever I speak, I try to educate, motivate, and invigorate. My goal is to leave people with a renewed sense of purpose, a, a renewed sense of destiny, a renewed sense of confidence in their ability to effect the African reality. Because psychologically, one of the things I see happening globally, and it's very dangerous, Africans are beginning to lose hope in our ability to change our circumstances. Mm -hmm. And all throughout our sojourn, ever since the fall of the great empires in antiquity, we've always had confidence in our ability to affect our reality. The Haitian Revolution, the fight against slavery, uh, the destruction of colonialism, the fight against neo-colonialism, civil rights, black power, no matter how low we were, we always believed confidently in our ability to overcome those circumstances. But now, here in the 21st century, I'm beginning to see racial depression. I'm beginning to see political depression. I'm beginning to hear even from conscious elders mm. that they don't think it's possible for us to change this around. So whenever I speak, I want to change that narrative in the African mind. I want people to leave feeling motivated, okay, and inspired to make a difference, not just give them information. Because I believe in the black consciousness movement so far in the 21st century, we have oversaturated the information. We have become information addicts. I would argue information overload. Mm. And I wanna draw a distinction though, because although we suffer from information overload, largely by way of social media, 
I don't think we get enough of quality information in terms of the black media. It's kind of what you guys do with The Voice, putting out that critical and relevant information. I am seeing black media, particularly in the Western world, mm. and your newspaper is an exception to this. And there's a few other newspapers that are an exception to this, but I'm seeing black media turn away from an information and agitation and investigation vehicle for black change to one that chases political satire, mm -hmm. to one that chases sensationalism, that one is over uh, inundated with what's going on with black celebrities, what's going on uh, with black athletes, uh, who got shot last night at the gas station, who hit the lottery, when is Beyonce coming back to town? That's not the origin of black media. Mm -hmm. And I can speak to that because the first black man to start a news organ in the Western Hemisphere, okay, uh, was John Brown Rustworm from Jamaica one of the fathers of Pan-Africanism. Mm -hmm. He started Freedom's Journal with Samuel Cornish in the States back in the 1830s. And the purpose of that newspaper was to educate, investigate, and advocate. Black media is no longer educating, investigating, and advocating. It is spreading gossip, sensationalism, slander, and rumor. And we need to get back to serving the needs of the people. There's so many di directions I could take this interview in, so many. Um, and I know our, our time here is limited. I wanted to get your thoughts on, particularly and specifically, what the young black man in 2018 should be focusing on. Mm. Given all of what you've just mentioned, the uh, information overload, what I call the foggy in of the mind, mm -hmm. given all of those things, what should we be focusing on? collectively and forget the transatlantic differences let's point to a unifying theme indeed from a pan-africanist perspective i would argue that the two most critical things that black men need to be focused on the entire diaspora but zeroing in on us black males mm -hmm. is actually the same in terms of what all african people should be focusing on and that's education and economics when you look at the mass incarceration the school to prison pipeline what I refer to in my book as the psychoacademic holocaust. You're looking at education being weaponized as a tool against black male empowerment. Men are the providers and protectors of the family. We can protect, but we struggle when it comes to providing because we're not giving the solid academic foundation that allows us to participate fully, okay, in different spheres of economic activity. So you don't see us in real estate the way we should be. You don't see us in the stock market the way that we should be. You don't see us as owners of property, controllers of capital, the way that our women and children need us to be. And that's because from birth, the black male child is systematically miseducated. It is on purpose. It happens in the UK. It happens in the US. It happens in Canada. And it happens in South Africa. In fact, the United Kingdom, the United States, and the Republic of South Africa share something in common. They have the three highest black male incarceration rates in the world. Wow. So what is it about the US, the UK, and the Republic of South Africa that has more black men going to jail than almost anywhere else in the world? You know what they share? They share the commonality of white supremacy. Racism is in its purest form here in the UK, in its purest form in the US, and it's in its purest form in the Republic of South Africa. And because racism is so aggressive, the incarceration of black males must take place because its goal is to keep the black male from competing equitably and fairly with the white male for political and economic control of society. This is why, in my opinion, as an educator and a psychologist, white women have no right educating black males. White men have no right educating black males. It is a natural conflict of interest for a member of my oppressor's community to be responsible for the liberation of the oppressed community. What white woman is going to prepare a black boy in London to be equitably prepared politically, economically, and socially to challenge her own son for control of this society 20 years from now? No white woman is going to put a black boy in that position, which is why she should never be allowed to educate him. So that education is key. And then the economics, they're destroying us through the economics. Lack of access to capital, lack of access to capital is the main strategy used in the Western world, US, Canada, UK, 
and even in Southern Africa and other places to keep the black male from being able to empower himself individually and collectively. What I'm saying is this, you may have the blueprints for an automobile that can outperform and outachieve Mercedes Benz and BMW. But if you go to one of the banks in the UK and you need a couple hundred million rand loan to build your factory and start producing your cars and importing your products, are you likely to get it? Not at all. He may have a business idea that is greater than Walmart, a black mark, if you would. But what bank in the UK is going to give him a line of credit to build his black marks to challenge Walmart? I may have a cell phone idea that exceeds the iPhone. I have an idea for a phone that would put the iPhone out of business. But what bank in the United States, what bank in the UK, what bank in Canada or Johannesburg is going to give me a loan to empower my idea, which would in turn allow me to do what? Put thousands of black men to work with my idea. We don't get access to the lines of credit. Now let's look at all the other ethnic groups in the UK. Chinese are empowered. European Jews are empowered. The Arabs are empowered. Why are they empowered? They're able to access capital through their own native banks and they bring it with them or they're able to access capital in your banks. Why? Because they suffer from the positive stereotype. If there is such a thing and the positive stereotype says the Chinese are hardworking. The positive stereotype says the European Jew is very industrious with his dollar. The positive stereotype says the Arab has a history of economic success and the negative stereotype, which affects us says, black people do not have the intelligence to handle large amounts of money responsibly. And because of that, they discriminate against us economically. The racism is in the banks. Remember, Dr. King was murdered. 50 years ago, not because he had a dream and not because he opposed the war on Vietnam. Dr. King was murdered because he was about to embark upon a breadbasket campaign. He was going to take poor black, poor whites to the United States government, the capital of the most powerful government in the world. And they were going to live there and sleep there and eat there. And no one was going to leave until they left with a home and a job. Dr. King was proposing economic revolution, and that's why he was murdered. The next stage of the Pan-African Renaissance in the international African struggle is a struggle for economic liberation. I'm aware that you're a man with many degrees. Yes, man. Yes, highly sir. educated. Um, something we all laud and salute. For our viewers, though, for some of our viewers and listeners, Talk about that educational background underpinning um, the platform that you have today. And talk about the fact that your voice is resonating further and further as more and more people identify with the things that you're bringing to life. Well, firstly, <clears throat> I benefit from something, and Sister Kim and I were talking about this last night on our drive, but I benefit from something that none of my predecessors had available to them, mm -hmm. and that's social network. Mm -hmm. You see, so my travels for my generation as a pan-africanist and a scholar have been unprecedented mm -hmm. and mr garvey didn't have that as an exposure el Haj, malik el shabazz malcolm x didn't have that kwame and Krumah, patrice lumumba uh steve beaker amakal cabros thomas sankara julius nairi they didn't have that at their disposal so i'm able to take advantage of the information age in the way that my forefathers of pan-africanism wasn't able to okay uh, with that being said, I think that I have a larger responsibility than even they had because to whom much is given, much is required. Great power. Comes you see, great responsibility. And as someone, you know, who is requested so often around the world, mm -hmm. I feel that I have an obligation to produce along with that, you see. And I think that with my educational attainments, that also requires me to be able to produce. Mm -hmm. And so in looking at my educational background, since I was a third grader, I had always wanted to be a psychologist since a third grader. Mm. Okay, uh, I stayed with that. So I went to a traditional, conservative, paramilitary high school. From there, I went to Millersville University in Pennsylvania, double major, psychology and political science because I considered law for a minute as well. Right. Kind of wish I would have stayed with it to an extent because I could have been far more effective as a school psychologist and a lawyer than I am as a school psychologist and a doctor of clinical psychology. I'd like to embellish on that, but go on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, 
after finishing undergrad, I stayed at the same institution, became a certified school psychologist, which was very unique because in America, special education, as it is in the UK, is a very big issue for black boys. The over-identification of African children as learning disabled and ADHD is a critical issue amongst our people. That's your core expertise, right? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And it is part of that school to prison pipeline, mm. you see, because it introduces them to low expectations mm. in some substandard instruction. Mm. So then after that, worked for the school district of Philadelphia, became a child therapist, uh, continued to practice as a school psychologist, went back and got my principal certificate and master's in educational leadership. And so now I'm working on building my own school, the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey Academy, which we hope to franchise around the whole diaspora once we build the first one. You see, but I say all that to say that the education for me was a blessing in that my professional work lends itself perfectly with my political work. So for example, some people are in professions that don't necessarily affect the African struggle. Mm -hmm. But with me being a psychologist, mental health is critical when it comes to African people. And the field of psychology has also been weaponized against us. So two nights ago, I made it a point to visit the home of Francis Golfin here in the UK. Okay. Now, he was in the 1800s, but he's the father of eugenics. Okay. This is the man who created the word eugenics. Oh, yeah. Good stock, the selective extermination of Africans and the selective reproduci reproducing of Europeans. He was Charles Darwin's cousin. This is the man who gave rise to the popular notion that Africans were half monkey, mm. half man, stuck in the chain of evolution from beasts to civilized man, you see. And this is the man who made popular special ed. He made popular sterilization. So I made it a point to go to his home because as a psychologist, I must respect that history. Mm. Although I hate him and what he did and may he burn in hell, mm. you understand? But again, getting back to my point, being a psychologist, I'm dealing with a major weapon against our people. Being an educator, I'm dealing with another major weapon and potential okay, a strategy of success that we can use as a people because I believe until we educate our own children, we'll never be free. You can't give your child's mind 18 years to the oppressor, get it back at age 17 and 18 and think you're going to re-Africanize them. You can re-Africanize them on the surface, but the unconscious has already been programmed by the European. We need to understand what my ancestor Frederick Douglass said. He said it's better to raise strong children than to repair broken men. Once the African mind has been colonized by the European construct, you can never totally get it back. Keep them free because you won't be able to re-free them later. Frederick Douglass, it's, it's interesting you touch on that. There's a petition going to bring back the journal that he The North founded. Star. The North Star, yes. yeah. Have you seen that? You're familiar I with that? I just saw it today. I just saw it today as well, actually. Someone from the UK yeah, 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 texted to me. Wow, that's amazing. I think it's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, I, but here's my challenge Go for, for that it, journal. go for it, because you're going to go back to the media again, right? Yes. Yes. Go for it. Well, first of all, mm. what, most people, what most people don't know about the North Star, mm. the North Star was not Frederick Douglass's paper exclusively. Right, okay. The North Star was co-edited by one of the grandfathers of Pan-Africanism, right. Martin Robinson Delaney, who came up with the quote, Africa for the Africans. Uh, Marcus Garvey borrowed that from Martin Delaney, who grew up in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, right. the same city I went to high school in. OK, and it was Marcus Garvey who borrowed that from Delaney and added those at home and those abroad. That's Delaney's quote. Wow. Delaney and Douglas co-edited the North Star, but because of ideological differences, mm. Pan-Africanism, mm. integrationism, mm. they split. And then that's when cousin Frederick renamed it the Frederick Douglas paper. So I'm hoping that they show the contributions of Major Dr. Martin Robinson Delaney, who, by the way, was the first black to be admitted into Harvard University, not W.E.B. Du Bois. It was Martin Delaney who was admitted into Harvard Medical School, but was forced to resign because the white students refused to go to class with him. Oh, so he was put out of Harvard, and then Du Bois, half a century later, becomes the first African American, or one of the first African Americans to get a doctorate from Harvard. But I want them to show the Pan-Africanist influence on the North Star, but I want them to recommit themselves to telling relevant, useful, important, and practical information about the black struggle. See, for me, we don't have time to talk about LeBron James going to the Lakers when only one out of every four black boys is graduating from high school. Mm. We don't have time to talk about, you know, who won the lottery last night 
when black women have one of the, in the Western world, have one of the highest infant mortality rates. How can black women living in some of the most uh, progressive medical societies on earth have one of the highest infant mortality rates? See, we don't have time to talk about reality TV and reality shows and, 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 and gangster rap when we look at one out of every four black males will be incarcerated at some point in their life. And the North Star newspaper, if I may say so myself, did an excellent job of focusing on the issues that matter, not the issues that entertain. One of our weaknesses as a people is that you have to entertain us to educate us. And I hate this concept of edutainment because what it says is black people are so undisciplined so politically immature that if they don't enjoy the information, they're not interested in learning the information. Like I said, we could talk all day. <laughs> Finally, um, back to your tour. It was too short. Yes, so sir. We, we need you to come back uh, to the UK. When's that likely to happen? And will it be another serious energy presented? It, 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 it may be another serious energy presents. Mm. Uh, definitely. I want to thank Mother Emma for doing these events, bringing me back mm. to the UK, obviously. Perfect. I have to thank the Power Assist Movement for introducing me to the UK and being responsible for those initial tours. I definitely will be coming back. I have some projects uh, that I want to see to fruition here right. in the UK. With Anything both. you want to speak on? Well, yeah. one thing I want to do is the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy. I want to put one here. Okay. I also want to put a Pan-African Nationalist bookstore here. And I'm also working on a documentary entitled The Shockumentary, uh -huh. The War Against Black Boys. And I want to come back and with the assistance of Power Sis, we're going to be interviewing parents throughout the United Kingdom on their stories, getting their testimonials of the hell and the hate and the racism that they've experienced through the social service system of the UK the special ed system of the UK, mm. the mental health system of the UK, the juvenile incarceration system of the UK, whether it's learning disabilities, autism, psychiatric med, school exclusion, juvenile incarceration, black on black crime, homicide, suicide, social service discrimination. I want black parents and black youth to tell their story as part of that narrative that shows that the miseducation of African children is not an American thing. It's not just a US thing, a Canadian thing, or a South African thing, it's a global thing. And so my documentary wants to show how this issue of education is at the foundation of all of the evils that African people suffer from. Education and economics. Those are the left foot and the right foot, the left fist and the right fist of black liberation. If you don't control the content, of your children's minds. And if you don't economically give African people opportunities to stop being dependent on their former colonizers for their existence, we will lose. Dollars and brain power. It stops and ends there. Dr. Umar Johnson, it's been a pleasure. Appreciate you, your time.